Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to today's Book of the Day show. I have an extremely special guest, Professor Richard Dawkins. And we are talking on the selfish gene, which uh, among many of his books is uh, a best-selling book, sold several million copies, and is one of my favorite books. I've ranked it on my book of the day, top 150 recommended in my top five. And uh, so thank you for being on the call from, uh, are you in, where are you today, in Oxford? In Oxford, yes. Awesome, well this is uh, very special and I like to just jump right in uh, to kind of the juiciest part, eat the dessert first, if you will, uh, okay. Professor Dawkins. So. Uh, I might bounce around a little bit, but what I wanted to start with is this concept that you talk about in the book of why humans have brains like we do. And one of them you say is so we can simulate the future without actually having to go through all the tri trial and error ourselves. Because you say, you know, trial and error takes time and is deadly. Um, do you think, if you could talk a little bit about that, because that's kind of the central thesis of this book of the day, you know, how can we use our brains? Uh, Warren Buffett says, we only learn through mistakes, but they don't have to be ours. Well, that's, yes. I mean, brains, of course, go back a long way in evolution, and not all brains do that. Human brains are perhaps a bit unusual in the ability to simulate the future, to do vicarious errors instead of real errors that lead to death. So when brains first started, I suppose you could say animals were programmed to do whatever was on average best for their survival. And then a bit later, they progressed on to learning where they could actually change as a consequence of experience of the past within their own lifetime. And then the next stage, which is the one you're talking about, is when they didn't even have to experience things. You could experience things vicariously in your imagination. Run a simulation, a what-if calculation. What if I did this? What if I did that? Uh, set up a scenario and then avoid actually endangering yourself by running the simulation vicariously in your head. That's something that humans do very well. Uh, it may be something that one or two other advanced mammals do, and perhaps birds do, but it's something that came probably rather late in evolution. Mm. Now, do you think uh, this ability to simulate, you know, you, you speak of uh, a flight simulator or a general, do you think, and this is just kind of a random question, are smarter people simply better at doing this? Or is it kind of innate to all humans we have a, a generally equal ability to simulate the future? Because in my experience in life, whether it be in business or personal, uh, my biggest regrets are those where I didn't just go, oh, someone else said not looking both ways before crossing the street is dangerous. Let me just take them at their word and let me not have to get hit by a car uh, but I find it prevalent among people where they pride themselves on their mistakes and they go, well, I had to go through that so I could learn. But if I hear you right, you're saying it's almost innately human to not have to do that, to not have to get hit by a car, to say... I, I mean, I'm sure like everything else, there's variation. And I'm sure that although all humans can do it, uh, obviously um, we vary in everything else. There's no reason why we shouldn't vary in the ability to simulate and some people are much more imaginative than others uh, and um, so uh, I don't think I would agree that everybody is the same in this yeah yeah well, I, I definitely see in my own personal experience which obviously is somewhat anecdotal about it but also let's move to this next uh, this next subject because I have so many written down if uh, hopefully we're not uh, jumping around too quickly I'm gonna hit you with lots of different things by the way, my favorite uh, 
accolade that you have is uh, you won the number one uh, in a survey. You were considered the number one intellectual in the world. I thought that was a nice one to have. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's good. You say on this simulation, you I wrote down a note in your book. You said survival machines that can simulate the future are one jump ahead of survival machines who can only learn on the basis of overt trial and error. The trouble with overt trial is that it takes time and energy. The trouble with overt error is that it is often fatal. Simulation is both safer and faster. That may have been my favorite part in the whole book. Well, uh, I had forgotten it, but um, it's the part that you brought up first, and yes, I would certainly stand by that. I agree with that. I like, and and for people not familiar with the book, The Selfish Gene, uh, when you refer the phrase survival machines, you're referring to us humans in the sense that we're we're made up of these replicators, which you call, uh, which are our genes, and I'm correct. Survival machines is what we are. Yes, not just us, but but us in the sense of all living creatures, every body, every animal, every plant, every bacterium, every tree is a survival machine for the genes that ride inside it. Right. Okay, next, uh, let's talk a little bit about this concept of tit for tat, uh, the sense that there are strategies that we can use both uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, but also I think these apply in how we relate to other people socially. Uh, so the concept, if someone's not familiar in this game theory, is uh, you can explain it better. But we, when somebody acts one way to us, we can we fall in one of three categories. We can be a sucker, which mean we're are, we are taken advantage of. We can be a cheater. We can be the one taking advantage. Or we can be a grudger, where we act nicely until somebody uh, does something wrong, then we use our memory to hold a grudge against them. How does this relate in everyday life, this concept? Not just at a cellular and genetic level, but in our behaviors. Game theory of that kind originated in human sociology and human psychology and human economics. So it comes from humans and was imported into biological evolution theory, mostly by John Maynard Smith. And in The Selfish Gene, I was talking about it as a biologist. Uh, it, it is a very powerful mathematical theory for handling cooperation among not just humans, but all sorts of other creatures. When you come to humans, it's probably a lot more complicated than just a very simple cheats and suckers and grudges model that I proposed. I actually proposed that for the very simple case of birds who have fleas or parasites, uh, say lice, and have to uh, borrow each other's beaks in order to get rid of them because they can't reach the tops of their heads. So although they can groom most of their feathers and get rid of the, of the lice, they can't get rid of those from the tops of their heads, and so it's a you scratch my top of head. I'll scratch yours. That's a very, very simple model. But that, that simple game theory model can be generalized to all sorts of much more complicated situations, which is what human cooperation mostly is. Now, a mathematical model like that is, is helpful to get the basic idea, but then you, you need to, uh, it, to elaborate it and make it much more complicated, especially for humans. One of my mentors told me, he said, Ty, if you're playing poker, after 30 minutes, if you're not sure who the sucker at the table is, you're the sucker. Yes, okay, that's a nice one. I've never actually played poker, so, but I can imagine what that would mean. Yeah, I think socially life, you know, somewhat falls that way. I think yes. I was reading about game theory. I, I think it might be referred in your to in your book in the sense that one of the best strategies 
is start out night. Oh, this is, I think, Dr. David Buss, who, who's a professor of evolutionary psychology at University of Austin. And he says, yes. Yes. Uh, start out nice and then reciprocate. Yes, that, that, that is tit for tat. It's an extremely simple strategy. Start out nice and then reciprocate. And reciprocation kind of looks like paying back. And so if the other person does something not nice, then if you reciprocate, that is, you can think of that as payback. He said there, there's a few exceptions. For example, if you're in a room where everybody's a thief, then he said you don't always start out nice. But in general situations, I thought that was yes. interesting. Yes. Interesting. Okay. ESS. Let's talk about that for a second. Evolutionary stable strategies. I find this fascinating uh, in the sense that the world, I mean, in capitalistic markets, if you study economics and the stock market, there's this concept of equilibrium, that supply and demand. If people want a lot of hamburgers, enough uh, fast food restaurants, McDonald's, Burger Kings, and so on will arise to meet the demand. And if there's too many stores and not enough people, some will go out of business. So this is an economic concept, uh, somewhat similar to uh, this ESS how does ESS affect us at a biological level? What does it mean that, that we're seeking uh, uh, evolutionary stable strategies? Um, natural selection expects that animals will do what's best for their own survival. But what's best for their own survival may depend upon what the majority of the population are doing. So if you imagine a population of seagulls, say, where most of them are fishing for, for fish, but a minority of them are, are specializing in stealing fish from the, uh, from the honest fishers. So we have pirates who steal fish, and we have fishers who actually fish for fish. Now, what's the best strategy? Uh, the answer is that whichever is in the majority is likely to be exploited by the other. So if the population is entirely dominated by honest fishers, then natural selection will favor pirates because there's plenty of fish to be had by piracy. That would mean that natural selection favoring pirates means the pirates will become more and more numerous in the population as the generations go by. And that would mean that when the population is entirely dominated by pirates, there are no fish to be had. And now natural selection will favor honest fishing. Well, you might think it would go oscillating between domination by fishing and dominated by piracy. Actually, it will settle down to some equilibrium frequency. It might be 10% pirates and 90% honest fishers. Uh, that's just a, fig a made up figure. But whatever it is, natural selection will stabilize the proportion, equilibrium frequency, by favoring whichever one is less than the equilibrium frequency. Now this has implications somewhat similar to game theory in the sense that... Uh, it's game theory. That, yeah. Yeah, that is game theory. Okay. So it's, it's a, a game theory, uh, another term for it. Now, what's the implications for, let's say, in society? Uh, you know, there's this thought... There was a movie, American Sniper, which came out. It was a somewhat controversial movie about a sniper in the U.S. Army uh, military in Iraq. And there's a line, I don't remember exactly, but the father says, you know, there are wolves and there are people. So he, he kind of said, it was a little bit similar to this. Uh, there's, you know, if you don't know who the sucker in the room, you're the sucker. There will be suckers. There will be everyday citizens. And there are criminals it, are criminals uh, an extension of this theory in, in our everyday life in the sense that there are people who are honest working, a hard working people, and then there are people, a small percentage, you're never going to have, you know, 80% thieves because there has to be somebody producing the goods. But does this extend into these social things that we run into in life that drive us crazy, whether it be a, a cheating husband or wife, a, you know, somebody who burglarizes your house? Uh, and so on? I think it does. Um, 
the, the, uh, the ESS puts it into an evolutionary context where what happens is that um, frequencies change in the population. But you're quite right that there is an analogy with a minority of criminals in society. Humans, of course, are far more complicated because humans have policing. We have police forces who keep an eye on, on, on us. And, and so uh, that's something which you don't get, at least in any simple way, in biological nature. Now, we have things like, for example, parasites are interesting. I, I actually lived on a farm. I lived with the Amish for a couple of years, and I lived on a farm for eight or ten years. And you see there, you know, if you have sheep or cows, every farmer is dealing with parasites. And the parasites have this balance they want to maintain. They want to take some health and nutrients from the animal, but they don't want to kill the animal because when the animal dies, generally the, the parasite can't move to another host very easily. And that would be defined also in this ESS. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, and it depends a bit upon how the parasite leaves its present host. Uh, if the parasite, uh, it's, it's a method of exiting from the present host is via the present host's own offspring. If the parasite travels to the next generation, say in the eggs of the host, then it will really, really have the interest of the host at heart. Everything that the parasite wants, I'm using the word wants in quotes there, everything the parasite wants will be pretty much identical to what the host wants. The parasite in that case will quote want to keep the host alive as long as possible. If on the other hand it's the kind of parasite which they multiply uh, hugely inside the host and then makes the host burst into a great explosion and spread spores all over the countryside. Right. And that's a quite different thing. That would be, um, in, that, in that case, the interests of the parasite and host would be very different. And the parasite in that case would kill the host, as of course parasites sometimes do. Interesting. Let's talk about something that <clears throat> sometimes people consider controversial. Uh, I know that you don't, uh, but the United States is a pretty religious country. Uh, a lot of the world is, is very religious, and you define in the book, uh, your, your best-selling book, The Selfish Gene, you say, we are survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. This is a truth which still fills me with astonishment. That's what you say, and that, so from your standpoint, this blind programming that, that uh, sees us not as necessarily uh, divinely created beings, this makes you excited or, or astonished. A lot of people see that as uh, an affront to everything they believe about life. Um, and I know we can go this, talk about this for a long time, but what's your simple reply to people who say, well, if this is true, you know, how do you find meaning in life? If we're just robots blindly going around this planet, uh, what keeps us from falling into, you know, evil uh, Hitler-like thinking where we're just survival of, of the fittest and, you know, extermination of handicapped people? And so I'm sure you get led down this kind of trail of... of, of yes. Um, I, I've often said that although I'm a passionate... Darwinian when it comes to explaining the whole of life, including human life. I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to explaining why we exist, why we're the way we are. I'm a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to constructing societies. So politically and socially, I want to live in a society which is as un-Darwinian as possible. I want to live in a society where we sit down together and discuss the kind of society we want to live in, where we vote for the kind of government we want. And we do not, at least in my case, we do not vote for a Darwinian style of government, which is, as you say, selfish and ruthless uh, and not the kind of society in which I wish to live. We do not have to say just because nature is this way, we have to be that way as well. We can construct a society of friendship, um, and cooperation, which is a 
very un darwinian society. And that's the kind of society I want to live in. Is there a way to do, you know, this goal of a non-Darwinian society, but still understand uh, our, our roots as selfish creatures? For example, people who are pro, very pro-capitalism, they would say, look, capitalism uh, has an element of Darwinianism in that leave the markets to sort themselves out. And while no country really is truly capitalism, uh, capitalistic, we, we tend to add some level of social control. That would be an example of a of a hybrid sort of Darwinianism tempered by some human regulation. Is that is that how you see... Uh, yes, I, mean, I could easily imagine that somebody could have a political philosophy which was a kind of humane capitalism and which took the view that a humane society will automatically arise um, if the market is allowed um, free, free reign. Um, I, I don't subscribe to that political view myself, but I don't think it's automatically horrible uh, in the way that a truly Darwinian society uh, would be. So you would believe more in market control. You wouldn't leave it as much to the human spirit, so to speak. Well, I, I think, I mean, I could imagine a defense being made of a market-driven society as being one that actually does lead to greater prosperity. As I said, I, I don't think I would subscribe to it myself. I think I'm rather more in favor of a controlled society, but I, I have a deal of sympathy with friends of mine who believe that a, that a just and humane society will automatically arise if the market is, is, is allowed freedom in a sort of Adam Smith way. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. It's interesting to hear from you because, uh, I, you know, I would think maybe you'd be a little more Darwinian, but that's that's interesting to hear. Great. <clears throat> Let's talk about. Uh, you you say here it is a simple logical truth that short of mass emigration into space, with rockets taking off at a rate of several million per second. Uncontrolled birth rates are bound to lead to horribly increased death rates. It's hard to believe that this simple truth is not understood by those leaders who forbid their followers to use effective contraceptive, aka birth control. Thanks for us. Uh, so you say they, you say there is a natural method. It's called starvation for population limitation. If humans don't do this, when you say this, is it? Various religions, Catholicism, uh, and others that, that butt up against you? Well, yes, it is, and, and that's what I had in mind when I, when I wrote that. Um, however, it, it is also true that, um, uh, that that really does apply if, the, if there is uncontrolled birth rate, uncontrolled uh, reproduction, and... Uh, but, but what actually happens is that um, the more prosperity there is in a country, the more people do adopt birth control. So um, it, it, although theoretically the Roman Catholic Church is against contraception, in fact, if you look at, society, look at, at countries which are dominated by the Roman Catholic Church, if they're prosperous, um, then they, they use birth control as much as anybody else. So countries like France and Italy simply ignore the Roman Catholic Church and get on with birth control. Do you think that's because, you know, going back to this very root concept in the book, humans, I, I think Sam Harris wrote a book, uh, he write, writes a book saying, and Stephen Hawking kind of agrees that free will is somewhat an illusion in the sense that we're driven at a cellular or genetic level, as you speak of in this book, and our genes know that they're selfish, so they don't want to put themselves in an environment uh, where they will starve to death. Is that why you think this French and Italian uh, lower birth rate happens? Because they're driven at this innate level. We somehow understand, almost instinctually, uh, these things. I, no, I think I would be cautious about... Uh... I mean, I know you don't literally mean genes know what's good for them, but it is tempting, the, the rhetoric that I used in the selfish gene is tempting to mislead in that kind of way. I think I would rather say that 
um, our brains, going back to your original question, our brains have become so big and so good at simulating the future, so good at imagining, we can look into the future with our brains and see what the bad consequences of over-reproduction would be. We can actually look into the future. Uh, and that's something that is new, something that uh, in most of the evolutionary history hasn't been possible. Yeah. Now, food systems along this line of, of overpopulation and starvation, uh, there's a lot of controversy in the EU, in the United States, on genetically modified organisms. Of course, this has somewhat is in your, I know it's not your main area of expertise, but it's related in the sense that when you genetically modify organisms, you're, you're, you're going to the root of what makes uh, living creatures, you know, alive. What's your feeling on genetic modification, whether it be in food systems or just in general, uh, ethically and science, you know, and, and uh, with your expertise in genetics? And I think you're, is it an ethologist? Is that what you're referred to? I think it's, I'm not sure that it's really an ethical question about genetically modified foods. I, I think it's a question of prudence, really. Um, it, uh, it, it could be an unwise thing to do. It could be that, uh, that things could go terribly wrong. Um, and uh, in, in science, I think we do need to, in the application of science, we do, do need to apply precautionary principles and take care that anything we do doesn't have adverse consequences. Once again, imagine the future, simulate the future, imagine the things that could possibly go wrong. So I'm not sure it's a question of ethics, much as a question of prudence. And um, I think the dangers of genetic modification, they have been somewhat exaggerated, um, but I, I'm not in favor of a kind of gung-ho to do, do anything that we want to because we can. I think it is important to exercise prudence, exercise precautions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I would agree. I mean, as you read books uh, like yours, The Selfish Gene, you see this, it is a very complicated set of mechanisms going on at a genetic level uh, and it's probably going to take us a while to figure out how to reverse engineer them. Uh, you know, it's it's not it's not super easy. <laughs> it doesn't no, matter. that's right. It's it's very difficult to know. I mean, if you if you wanted to create an organism that was good for some particular purpose, uh, it's very hard to know how to do it. It theoretically probably could be done, but uh, it's it's much more complicated than many people realize. Exactly as you say. Yeah, oh, interesting. Now, let's talk about uh, on a personal level. I always say that we humans are juggling four balls at one time. I, at least consciously, subconsciously, this could be argued. Most humans want to be physically healthy. They want to be financially uh, secure in the modern world. That's money. It used to be resources. We want to have love in the form of, uh, of healthy social connections, and we want some feeling of happiness. Could you speak on happiness from the standpoint, uh, maybe a little more scientific and, and uh, genetic standpoint? What purpose do you see happiness serving it? And maybe the practical question, uh, can we be happy? What, what can we do knowing that we're somewhat these, as you refer to survival machines with these replicators, uh, which sounds so... At a very crude level, if we're talking Darwinism, I suppose that happiness is the state that the body is in when it's doing things which are likely to lead to its survival. And unhappiness, an extreme form would be pain, is the state the body's in when it's doing something which is likely to lead to its death. So pain uh, is a is a kind of warning that says, don't do that again. If you do something like pick up a red hot coal, you feel intense pain and you're not going to do that again. You learn not to do that again. If you persistently did things that lead to pain, then you're likely to die 
And so natural selection has favored brains which don't repeat things that are dangerous. On the other side, on happiness, natural selection has favored brains that do repeat things that give them a good feeling. So something like satisfying hunger, satisfying sexual desire, satisfying thirst, um, these are uh, being warm and comfortable. These are all uh, things that make us feel good, make us feel happy, and uh, they are also things which statistically are more likely to lead to our survival. That's, as I say, at a very mundane level, but happiness in humans has sort of taken off into the stratosphere of advanced things like happiness at listening to beautiful music and reading beautiful poetry, seeing a beautiful sunset. These are all probably very peculiarly human things which have taken the concept of happiness um, and run with it in directions which are not so easy to understand in a simple, naive, Darwinian way. Yeah, I think, do you think, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's interesting, I think it was Sigmund Freud uh, who said, the mind is like an iceberg, you know, 90% of it is below the surface in our subconscious. It seems that we do things that uh, mitigate or, or work against our momentary happiness, whether it be we know we shouldn't eat I'm sorry, they work against our long-term happiness. We eat a donut even though we know at a conscious level we shouldn't, that it's going to make us unhappy when we look at our our belly growing. And so it seems not only, uh, it seems like some of that could be explained in an evolutionary cycle. Uh, we're doing this because of our genes. Now they don't want, but our genes are operating as a fashion to survive and replicate but now it's yes. more complicated because... Yes, that's a very good point. And I think the way to understand that is to say that um, what our genes built into our brains was rules of thumb which worked at, a, at an earlier time in our history when we were hunter-gatherers on the African savannah. Uh, something like our love of sugar, which you just alluded to, um, because sugar, because sweet things were difficult to get, I mean, honey would have been the only real way of getting extremely sweet things. Um, fruits were available to and generally good for you. If you live in a world where it's pretty much impossible to get too much sugar, then a rule of thumb that says get as much sugar as you can would work, would, would improve your survival. Nowadays, we live in a world where we just simply buy sugar in the shop and buy sweets and chocolates and donuts and things. Um, nowadays, we, li we live in a world where the original rule of thumb, which is eat as much sugar as you can, no longer promotes our survival. It does the reverse. But the rule of thumb is still there. This concept of a rule of thumb, I think, is very important because, um, after all, uh, the rule of thumb that says, like sex, enjoy sex. Again, in our wild ancestors, that worked because sex led to reproduction, and reproduction was what it was all about. Nowadays, as like as not, we are using a contraceptive, and so that um, the desire for sex no longer has its biological function anymore. But we still desire it, because the rule of thumb is built into our brains. Now, okay, this brings up an interesting point. One of my favorite books, and another one in my top five, is Fro Sigmund Freud wrote a book that hasn't been read too often. It's a fairly complicated read. You may have read it. Uh, it's called Civilization and Its Discontents. And he goes through the, his uh, take on why we're happy and unhappy. And basically, you can boil it down to our genes are saying X will make us happy and civilization is saying why. So you brought up the example of, of, of reproducing and sleeping with people. So we, our genes are saying, you take a 21 year old boy, a uh, man in the world, he, want, he has this genetic programming to go out, sleep with as many women, but civilization is a somewhat more monogamy and marry one person. 
so he Freud says basically we'll never be fully happy. Do, do you think that there's truth to that? Yes, um, the idea that we'll never be fully happy because um, there'll always be more of an effort that we could put into it. Is that what you mean? We're, we're, we're constantly being driven to do more. You can never relax. You can never um, just sit back and, and just bask in pleasure. Well, that and that society has set up things, for example, that have will not allow us to express our genes in the sense that your genes say, as a man, sleep with the most women to maximize your great-grandchildren, where society says, no, you can marry one. So there's almost this war uh, between, you know, our genes... I see what you mean. Yes, yeah. I think that, that is true. Um, and uh, it, it, we're constantly coming back to, you know, humans are very complex. And the selfish gene is actually not mostly about humans. It's about life in general. And you, I think you have to understand how life in general works, which is what the book's mostly about. And then you come on to humans, and you have to, as it were, treat humans in a more sophisticated way. We were, we evolved by natural selection in the same way as every other living creature on Earth. But we have these much more complicated brains, and we have a complicated society. And society does impose restrictions, rules which may conflict with our own desires yeah interesting let let's talk about something that applies uh at the genetic level in general applies to multiple species and you hear it talked about a lot nature versus nurture uh and this is there's there's schools of thought uh what where do you stand what part of behavior is just somewhat inherent and what part is learned by the environment is it 50 50 i know that's an oversimplification but what what well, how do you yes, say? It, it, it's an oversimplification because it varies for different things um what could that possibly mean when you put a figure like 50 50 um what it really refers to is the variation in the population to what extent can you predict the variation in the population if you know about genes and if you don't know about genes. Now, the, the best way to test this is by looking at twin studies. That means you take monozygotic twins, identical twins, and you take dizygotic twins, non-identical twins, and you know that monozygotic twins have twice as many genes in common where it matters than dizygotic genes. And you have a few cases where twins have been reared apart for one reason or another. They've been separated at birth, so they've had different environments. And if you compare how similar identical twins are to each other versus fraternal twins, non-identical twins, and if you compare both sets of twins reared apart versus reared together, you can come up with a figure the so-called heritability, which is often expressed as a percentage, like 50%, as you suggested. And it varies a lot. And things like height has a very high heritability. Um, weight would have a lower heritability because it might depend upon how much they've eaten. Um, musical ability has high heritability. Mathematical ability has high heritability. Other things have low heritability. And so... It is an interesting question. It's a question that you can answer by doing either twin studies or something equivalent to twin studies. Um, and so there's no general answer to the question. That's interesting. So some things, I didn't know muse, so music is, I, I think uh, Bach had 23 children and a lot of them were great musicians. So that, that uh, high heritability. And, yeah, and his father was. Yes. Now... One of the fascinating things in the book that goes right along with this subject of nature versus nurture is uh, you, you have this concept which why, and, and I'll oversimplify here, I, I probably shouldn't be oversimplifying what you're saying, but you know, one of the questions is why do humans, uh, and not just humans, but species reproduce 
genetic, uh, sexually as opposed to just like ferns or something. And you call this, uh, I think, the bottleneck. I found this fascinating. And, and three reasons. So the bottleneck is could be understood maybe as humans. We all start out as this one cell and we grow from little babies. We don't just cut our arms off and another human kind of sprouts out of our arm without having to go through the full reproductive cycle. And this is in the, the chapter, The Long Reach of the Gene. And you go through three main reasons that we do that. Uh, why? Can you, uh, can you kind of speak on this, on this subject? It's a very, uh, um, I, I think it's, this wasn't in the original uh, first edition of The Selfish Gene. This was actually in my second book, The Extended Phenotype, which is for uh, my professional colleagues. And the idea of the bottleneck is that um, unlike, say, a plant where you could propagate a plant by taking a cutting, so you can take a bit of a leaf and stick it in the ground or a bit of a stem and stick it in the ground and it will grow a new one. Um, animals on the whole don't do that. Animals go to a bottleneck, a single cell which contains all the genes which are going to give rise to a new, a new creature. Now, the effect of a bottleneck is that every single gene in the full body, say a human body or a hippopotamus's body, every gene has only one way of getting into the future, and that is through the sperms or eggs. That's the bottleneck. And so there is total cooperation between all the genes because they all have the same expectation of how to get into the future by the bottleneck, via the bottleneck. If they reproduced like plants, where you just chop off a bit of an arm and stick, a, stick the arm in the ground or something and it grows into a new hippopotamus, um, it wouldn't be like that because then arm, genes in the arm would have a different aim from genes in the leg. It's because of the bottleneck that we um, can expect that the entire, um, sorry, my, my wife just arrived, I'm, I'm being distracted slightly. Um, <laughs> okay. because, because of the bottleneck that um, animals are such coherent unitary bodies, they work together, they have the same number of limbs, the same number of sense organs, Everything about the body works as a single unit. And that's one of the big differences between animals and plants. That in animals, the entire body works as a whole, as a unit, as a cooperative entity. Whereas in plants, you could think of it as much more of a, a straggling, um, almost like a society of, of leaves or of, or of stems. Yeah, you say... The three reasons, the you know, back to the drawing board, orderly timing cycle, and cellu cellular uniformity. I like this concept of back to the drawing board. Would drawing you board, say? Okay. Would you say yes. that that the fact that we go through this bottleneck, we humans yes. start as babies. Okay. This allows us to. Is this allow us to thrive more because there's more possibility for mutations and and great new changes to to occur. Yes, let me take the back to the drawing board point. If you take something like a complicated organ, like a heart, which is it's a very complicated thing, it works as a pump, it's got four chambers and so on. Um, if, you could, if you had to evolve the heart by taking an ancestral heart and changing it, actually changing the shape of it, it wouldn't work. But because you go back to a bottleneck, it's as it were back to the drawing board. You go back to the bottleneck, you start afresh. Each generation starts as a single cell, a single fertilized egg, and it grows by cell division. And so there is the possibility for uh, the next generation's heart to be different from the previous generation's heart because it goes back to the drawing board. It starts from scratch. Yeah. If you imagine that evolution didn't work like that, if you imagine that each generation started out as the previous generation and kind of tinkered with it, 
uh, like modeling clay or like a sculptor, then you couldn't get anything like the same complexity of things like hearts and brains and kidneys and wings. The back to the drawing board is a very important aspect of the bottleneck life history. Yes, I love that point. Now, we sp you speak of these replicators, our, 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 these genes, these templates. Where do you think that the uh, the first genes came from? I've seen, I've read all kinds of theories. Some scientists think that that it was came on an asteroid and hit the planet. If we go way back, uh, do you ascribe to any of those kind of theories, or do you think it was a, a random process that just came to be at the beginning of planet Earth in time? Nobody knows. Uh, it's, it's one of the great gaps in our knowledge. Um, we know that the origin of life had to be the origin of the first self-replicating entity. It probably wasn't DNA, but it was something like DNA. Uh, DNA is too advanced. Um, it's, it's been called a high-tech replicator. So it probably wasn't DNA. Um, but something a bit like DNA. Now, as to whether that came from an asteroid or started out as a random accident on Earth, we don't know. I'm inclined to think it came, it, it, it started on, on Earth. What has happened, however, recently is that we've discovered that asteroids bombarding the Earth do contain organic molecules of, of the sort which would have been useful raw materials for the origin of life. So once upon a time, theories of the origin of life thought that they had to explain where these organic molecules came from. They had to somehow be synthesized on Earth. We now know that the universe is full of these organic molecules because they hit Earth in the form of meteorites. So... Um, that part of the, what was originally a difficult problem, that part of the difficult problem is now solved. Um, complicated organic molecules, even things like amino acids, uh, are present in rocks that are hurtling around the universe, or at least the solar system. And so that, that part probably did come from outer space, but I would be surprised if the first self-replicating molecule, the first equivalent to DNA came from outer space, although it may have done, uh, and it's one of the exciting areas of speculation in biology. It brings a new meaning next time you see a meteor shower, you could wonder uh, yes, what yes. amino, what proteins or amino acids are bolting in through the, from across the globe, uh, the, across the universe. Uh, let me ask you this. We memes you're you're famous for this concept of of memes which are not gen dna level replication but uh they could be understand may understood maybe socially can you can you talk on those for a second and, and uh how um, those apply the, to your book yes the, the, the last chapter of the first edition of the selfish gene since the whole of the rest of the book had been about dna had been about genes had been about um, self-replicating molecules as the basis for natural selection and evolution. I wanted to make the point that anything self-replicating could potentially do that job. Uh, maybe in outer space there are other forms of life which don't have DNA, but they surely do have some equivalent, something self-replicating. And then I suggested, well, maybe we don't have to go to outer space. Maybe we can find self-replicating entities on our own planet, memes, units of cultural inheritance, units of uh, in imitation. Humans imitate other humans. We imitate uh, tunes that we whistle. We imitate clothes fashions. We imitate accents with which we speak. We imitate fashionable words. We Im school children imitate crazes favorite toys, that kind of thing. And so there is a sort of self-replication going on in human society. And it's possible 
that these memes, these units of uh, imitation in human society, human culture, could be the basis of a form of Darwinian selection. The tunes that are catchy are the ones that get whistled, and the ones that get repeated. So boring tunes don't get repeated. Good tunes do get repeated. And the definition of good would not, it's interesting because, like you say, we have to be careful not to anthropomorphize, you know, DNA. It's not good, it's the ones that are efficient at passing on. So what makes a, a, yeah, go ahead. The definition of good is that which gets passed on, exactly right. Would you say, so clearly fashion, music, now, Media, whether it be the internet and TV and movies, these are in some ways almost the hosts that are, they're almost the bodies that are passing this on so quickly. Because without the internet, this meme replication of knowing every kid wanting to wear the same shirt or the same brand or listen to the same Kanye West or Lady Gaga, this wouldn't happen as well. So would you consider the media conduits or what is the media in this sense? Good. I mean, I, I think the internet is a fascinating new ecology, a, few, a new ecosystem for memes, enabling them to spread faster and more widely than was possible when I wrote The Selfish Gene, which was before the internet. Yeah. Now... One of the memes, without a doubt, one of these concepts that spread has been through religion. Uh, I know you're not a, a, a propo- well, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is there anything that you find redeeming in, in religion in the way it's currently taught, whether it be Christianity, Islam, Judaism? What, what is your take? Well, a lot of... Uh very good people are religious, um, I would be a bit sad if the reason they are good is that they're religious, because that would imply that they are only good because they are attempting to suck up to their God. They are frightened of going to hell or they want to go to heaven. That would be a rather ignoble reason for being good. I would prefer to hope that most people are good for other reasons. And I, there certainly is no evidence that religion does reduce criminal behavior or um, antisocial behavior. There are people who seem sincerely to think that if they were not religious, they would immediately go out and start raping and pillaging and stealing and killing. I'd like to think that that's not true. Um, and I'd like to think that many of us who are not religious are capable of being just as good, just as nice, just as altruistic, just as cooperative as those who are religious. You say, let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. Let us understand what our selfish genes are up to because we may then at least have the chance to upset their design, something that no other species has ever aspired to. As we kind of close up here, uh, altruism, charity, in light of the selfish gene, can you explain? There's different schools of thought on why we're, we still exhibit you know, doing good deeds for others, maybe leaving a tip with a waiter we'll never see again. How do you explain uh, yeah. altruism? I think that's quite difficult. Um, we, we talked earlier about EFF, as we talked earlier about tit for tat. Um, there are primitive evolutionary roots to cooperation. Um, You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. People do things in the expectation of getting it paid back. And similarly, um, kinship. Uh, There are good genetic reasons for being altruistic towards your close genetic kin, because the gene that makes you altruistic is statistically likely to be shared by other individuals who are your kin, your siblings, your nephews and nieces, your grandchildren, and so on. So there are primitive reasons for being good. What's less easy to understand is why we're good towards people whom we're never going to see again, like, as you say, you tip the waiter, you're never going to go back to that restaurant, and you are good to people who are not your relations, and you're never going to see them again either. 
Um, I think I would appeal to the same idea as the rule of thumb that I mentioned earlier. Natural selection favored rules of thumb in our wild ancestors at a time when we lived in small bands, small roving bands or small villages, where everyone that you met would be somebody that you would meet again and again and would probably be a cousin or some kind of relation as well. So there were good Darwinian reasons to be nice to everyone because everyone was either kin and or somebody who could reciprocate at a later date. Now, once that rule of thumb has been built in, just like the rule of thumb that says like sugar or like sex, the rule of thumb is in there even though the environment has now changed, we now live in a world full of sugar, we now live in a world where we're surrounded not by kin and we're surrounded not by potential reciprocators. But still the rule of thumb is there. The rule of thumb is in our brains and it says, be nice to everyone. Just as the other rule of thumb says, enjoy sex, even though you're using contraception. So the rule of thumb doesn't change just because we now live in a changed environment where it's no longer in a Darwinian way applicable. So we have a lust to be nice, a lust to be friendly, a lust to be empathetic, sympathetic, just as we have a lust for sex. And the two lusts survive from the time when they really were biologically relevant into the time today when they're no longer biologically relevant, but they're still there lurking in our brains. I think they call that the mismatch. That's an evolutionary psychologist. So we have these simple decision-making heuristics, and they stick with us. Uh, even though now we live in cities where most people will be anonymous, uh, yeah, you see that mismatch is really. As I ask you these questions, it's so much related to the the second you take any organism, humans or otherwise, out of the environment in which their DNA uh, evolved. All of a sudden, their decisions aren't always as <laughs> smart as uh, they were in. No, the... that's right. Yeah. Now, I'm very glad of it because I like to live in a world where we are nice and empathetic and kind. Yeah. All right. A few questions as we end here. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw three relatively quick ones. What is your this is the this is a, a step back from this more academic thought? Uh, or what's your daily schedule? Diet, when you wake up, what you do? <laughs> oh, I don't have anything very, very well organized. Um, I, I um, work at my desk. I go to lunch in my college, New College. I'm a fellow of New College, Oxford. I go to lunch there. Um, I work with my assistant some of the time. I take the dog for a walk. Um, nothing very, very exciting. <laughs> Could be exciting. There's a lot going on in your brain, so the excitement is right there, right? Okay, number two. Um, you speak, I was reading about you had a mentor, Tin Bergen, and I'm sure you've had different ones. The best thing a mentor ever taught you? Oh, the best thing. Um... Or what stuck with you the most? It could be I, colloquial. It doesn't have to be a deep scientific um, I theory. think that um, only ever trust evidence. Uh, to, for what, what you believe about the real world should be supported by evidence, not by um, personal feelings. You can't help having personal feelings, of course, and they are extremely important. But don't use them as grounds for believing anything. Interesting. All right, I had what, one question submitted by another person. It was, uh, do you believe in monogamy, that this is realistic? Humans are, there's more divorce than, say, there was in the 50s. Do, do you, is, according to the theories of the selfish gene, is monogamy viable? It's a difficult question to answer because if you look at human societies, uh, a fair number of them are polygamous, and a fair number of them are monogamous. So unlike other species where you can say this species is definitely polygamous, like 
elephant seal, for example, are harem-based polygynous societies where you have a minority of males monopolizing a majority of females. There are some human societies in which that's true. There are other human societies where faithful monogamy is the rule. And so there is no um, easy evolutionary answer to the question of what mating system humans naturally and primitively adopted. Interesting. All right, two quick questions left. Theories on the diet. Are you proponent of that we're omnivores, vegan, vegetarian, meat eating? Uh, we are primitively uh, meat eating omnivores. Um, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right thing for us to do all the time. Um, and uh, I have a lot of respect for vegetarians, especially vegetarians who don't eat animals on conscientious grounds. Well, one quick question I've always wondered, how often, how quickly can DNA change? I mean, is it, I heard once somebody say at the rate of 1% per 10,000 years, it sounded like not a good answer. Do you, do you know that answer? Because people often ask me, well, 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 it's very variable. I mean, different, different. You're talking about mutation rates, and yes. um, they, they, and that they are extremely, extremely variable. Um, in some cases, um, parts of the genome don't change for hundreds of millions of years, um, and they're maintained by natural selection. In other cases, they they do change uh, rather rapidly. So there is no general answer to that question. Are humans though going to look s relatively similar in a thousand years, or do you think that there's now excluding things like computerizing our brain? But just if we were left to our own devices, but we have all the modern, you know, amenities, do you see? Re are we going to be a lot taller? Are we going to be way smarter? Or is there some cap on that kind of growth in a let's say a thousand years or five hundred? Thousand is a very short time to be asking an evolutionary question. Um, Things like height are actually changing dramatically anyway um, over the decades. I mean, if you look over the 20th century, um, height in various peoples like Japanese, like Americans, um, average height has increased enormously. This is almost certainly not a genetic effect. It's almost certainly an uh, environmental, probably nutritional effect. If you're asking about uh, actual evolutionary genetic change, as I said, a thousand years is too short a time. If you talk about, say, 100,000 years or a million years, that's the kind of time scale you want to be talking about for evolution. In order for that to happen, in order to see a consistent evolutionary change over a million years, it would be necessary for natural selection to work in a consistent direction for much of that million years. That's rather hard to imagine with humans because our environment is changing so rapidly because of culture and technology that whatever it takes to be a good survivor or in particular a good reproducer at the present time is unlikely to be whatever it will take in a hundred years, let alone a million years. So it's very hard to predict. If we send colonists out to they colonize Mars, where conditions are very different and where genes flow between the home planet Earth and the uh, colonized planet Mars, where gene flow is very, very slight, then you might expect to see some evolutionary divergence. All right, last question. Selfish gene, for a lot of people following me are entrepreneurs, they're people interested in being successful. Uh, someone listening in from all the, the, the decades studying uh, this fascinating concept of, of us humans at the replication level, any advice you would offer more practical on being financially uh, more prosperous, both as an individual and as a society? What do you think? No, I, I would prefer not to do that because I would like to emphasize in conclusion that the, the title, The Selfish Gene, emphatically should not be interpreted as anything to do with selfish individuals. Um, selfish genes are just as capable of building altruistic, cooperative, generous individuals under the right conditions. 
So I, I, I emphasize this because the book has often been misunderstood because of the title. Yeah. As some suggesting that humans are selfish or even advocating that humans ought to be selfish. Like you, and it, it's yeah. neither of those things. So it's conscious capitalism, that, like you mentioned earlier, that's really what you're a proponent of. Awesome. Well, well yeah, if I, I would like to emphasize that the, the, the book is, is, is supposed to be um, a, a, an imaginative explanation for the whole of life. It's not really about selfishness. Yeah. It's about life as a whole. And it explains how everything about life, its complexity, its beauty, it, um, its, 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 its elegance, its illusion of design, everything comes about through the natural selection of genes, which are selfish only in the sense that they are working for their own survival. And working for their own survival is in many cases equivalent to working for altruistic, unselfish individuals. Yeah, like Rabbi Hillel said, if I, if I don't love me, who will? But if I only love me, what am I? So there, we're... <laughs> yes, okay. Well, Professor Dawkins, thank you so much for your time. If people want to follow up with you, is there a website? Is there a new book out? What's the best way? Uh, okay, to... well, the, the website is richarddawkins.net. Okay. Um, hey. And new book, well, the, um, the second volume of my autobiography, which is called Brief Candle in the Dark, uh, and I got, as a matter of fact, the very first copy of that arrived in the post today. Um, so it's not yet published. It will be published, I think it's on the 12th of September or thereabouts, sometime in September anyway. Um, so that's the second volume of my autobiography. The first volume, uh, which was called An Appetite for Wonder, covered the years from childhood until the selfish gene. And the second volume, Brief Candle in the Dark, covers the years from the selfish gene until the present. Well, thanks so much, Professor Dawkins. Uh, I appreciate you being here explaining the book, The Selfish Gene. Uh, for all of you who have not read it, it is on my recommended top five. Uh, Professor Richard Dawkins, thanks so much. Thank you very much.